Welcome to Distance Learning with Common Sense. My name is Tali Horowitz and I'm the New York Education Director. This conversation will be posted to our Common Sense Education YouTube channel, along with links and resources shared and discussed today in our chat. So let's go ahead and get started. I am joined today by Noah Rauch, Senior Vice President for Education and Public Programs at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. And I, I just want to start by saying, Noah, um, today is 9-11, we're commemorating the day, and we really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Um, do you mind sharing a little bit more background about yourself and about the Memorial and Museum? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you again for, for having me on today of, of all days. Um, so I oversee the education department at the Nile Memorial Museum. I've been working on this project uh, for about 10 years, almost exactly 10 years, actually. I started um, on the ninth anniversary, which is just sort of unbelievable to, to think about. Um, and I was brought on to help think about how do we tell this really difficult story, this really difficult history, um, in advance of the memorial and the museum opening. So the memorial opened on the 10th anniversary of the attacks, nine years ago today. And the museum opened in May of 2014, so a little over six years ago. And as a memorial and museum, we have this, this dual mission to honor the lives of those who were killed, the almost 3,000 victims, and also to remember what happened and understand why it's still important. And so that dual mission informs everything that we do. And of course, today being the anniversary um, is, is a centerpiece of our year. I mean, we, we Programs that we work on are really focused, especially with K-12 teachers and students, to not just be tied to this day, but this day is obviously about commemoration and remembering what was happening, what happened, um, and honoring those uh, who were killed. Uh, that's a that's a really powerful mission, and um, we're now almost two day two decades out from the attack. Can you share a little bit about how you talk to students today about it? And also, you know, of course, we're in the midst of the pandemic. How has COVID impacted your work? Uh, how has COVID, well, there's a lot there. Um, and I'm t I know I'm talking to teachers, um, preaching to the choir in terms of how much it's changed, um, how we think about our work. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, now, you know, no one in high school uh, has, was alive when 9-11 happened. And that wasn't the case when I first started working here. When I first started working here, you would talk to 13 and 14 year olds and they would have a memory um, and then they would recognize that, uh, you know, students, friends that were a year or two younger didn't. They had, that was the line between memory and history. And they had identified this line. And, you know, over the past 10 years, I've seen this line creep up, creep up. So now really no one in college has a lived memory uh, of the attacks. And we work a lot with professional agencies, government agencies. And we found that now the first responders, new agents and analysts in the FBI, you know, they're starting to lose that memory too. And so as we've been thinking about our work for the past decade, We've really been thinking about how do you tell the story to those who remember, because everyone above a certain age, you know, it is one of those moments that sort of ties us all together. So how do you tell the story to them that resonates with them, but also tell the story and have it resonate and connect with students who don't have that memory. And so, you know, when I think about the effect of COVID um, on our work, you know, in the simplest sense, it's changed, you know, completely the delivery mechanisms of course, of sort of how we do what we do. You know, all of our on-site programs right now are on hiatus. Uh, so everything has moved into the virtual realm, whether they're school field trips or public tours um, or professional development workshops, it's all online. Um, but on a, on a deeper level, you know, when I was talking before about the mission of the institution, it's about understanding what happened that day. And I, just a key feature of what happened that day is that people stepped forward in whatever ways they could. In the words of Alison Crowther, who was the mother of Wells Crowther, the man in the red bandana, uh, you know, in ways both big and small. You know, of course you have first responders rushing towards you know, two burning buildings. Uh, you have coworkers helping coworkers. You have people coming to ground zero to the pile in the aftermath of the attacks to lend whatever expertise and support they could, many at the expense of their own health and safety. And so those being, so those aspects of the story, which is such a key feature of that day and the days afterwards, um, what do we see now with COVID? We see the same thing. We see health workers stepping forward and others doing whatever they can do, often at the you know, risk of their own health, to be able to help in the ways that they can help. And so you know, this is now infused in, in a very real way, the work that we do and the connections that we make. And you know, the program that we run on the anniversary, so today, uh, which is, focuses on the stories of a few people who were affected, 
Um, that's supplemented by a live chat that we do uh, with students from around the world. And the questions that come in uh, are often about our own experiences. Um, they're, they're factual questions, but they're also about just sort of how we felt, what it was like to be alive. But they're also making this identification. They're also asking about how does that impact today? How is, what is, how is today sort of like what it was in 9-11? They're grappling with the fact that they're living through history. Um, and so, you know, more and more as we think about what our programs look like in the coming months, um, that's going to be a key feature of it. I, um, I appreciate you highlighting, too, the role of storytelling. And I'm wondering if you can share a couple of stories with us that you do share with students as well. Yeah, it's, um, you know, for those of you who have been to the museum, um, it's a, you know, we feel very strongly that we get across the accurate history of what happened that day. Um, that students and the, anyone who comes to the museum leaves with, with that understanding. Um, so there's that authoritative voice, but it's also told in many ways through the experiences of individuals. Um, this was experienced by individuals around the world. An estimated 2 billion people watched in real time, a third of the world's population at the time. People from over 90 nations were killed. And so this was something that was experienced by almost everyone on earth. And so the stories that we tell, the history that we tell is told through that kind of narrative, that storytelling narrative. And so the exhibitions uh, sort of have that pedagogy and our own education programs have that as well, because you can't, you just can't wrap your head around, you know, the death of almost 3000 people. You can't wrap your head around just the scale of the repercussions of the attacks. You need something to hold on to. And you need the stories of individuals, which is why we, you know, the program that we hold today is really centered around those individual stories. And so a program, you know, a story, um, you know, that, uh, you know, that we use with, um, that we use with students of all ages, um, you know, some are focused on the day and some are focused in the aftermath of the day. Um, but I think both in their own way, uh, focus on how people choose to respond in that moment. They're looking up, they're experiencing sort of an unimaginable horror and they choose not to, to stop. They don't, they want to do something to redeem it or, or to fix it. They don't, want, they don't stop at that trauma. And we see this over and over and over again. So a story that comes to mind, which you might be familiar with, is the story of the, the man in the red bandana. I mentioned Alison Crowder earlier, her son. Uh, so a uh, 24-year-old equity trader living or working on the 104th floor of the South Tower. This was the second tower that was hit. The tower was struck at 9.03. And after the building is struck, he calls his mom and says, I'm okay. And that's the last that Allison hears um, from Wells. In the spring of 2002, if you remember, there were a lot of articles, for, you know, especially in the New York Times, recounting what it was like inside the towers. And uh, she comes across this article of survivors who were at the top of the South Tower. And they're recounting this man in the red bandana who had put people on his shoulders, taken them downstairs, come back up, directed people to safety. There was only one stairwell that was passable um, at the top of the South Tower. And she immediately realizes that's Wells. No one knew who he was. He, they knew that he had a red bandana. No one could identify him. And she knew because Wells always wore a red bandana. So the time he was a kid, his father wore a blue one. He wore a red one. Uh, and he always wore a helmet. He was a volunteer firefighter. Um, and he wanted to actually become a firefighter um, and leave his job in finance to do that. And in that, moment, in that moment of choice, he basically made the choice that he was thinking about making anyway and became a New York City firefighter. His remains were found alongside fire, New York City firefighters. And a few years later, he became um, the first civilian to ever posthumously be named a New York City firefighter. So that's someone who sort of makes that choice to help in that moment. He could have gotten out of the building, but instead he saved at least a dozen other people. Another story that comes to mind, another story that comes to mind um, which actually has a connection to that story, um, is a story of Kameli Nyoma who's a member of the Maasai, he's from Kenya, he's actually in New York City at the time, he was going to school in California. And he sees what happens, and he, like anyone else, he didn't, what do you do? Um, and so he, about a year later, he goes back uh, to Kenya, and he recounts what had happened to people who were um, from his village. The village had roughly 3,000 people, they'd gotten electricity actually the summer of 2001. And so they had vaguely heard what had happened, but had no sense of the scale or really what had happened. And so he recounts this and he goes back because what he wanted to do was he wanted to donate a cow, which for him was the most that he could give. The cow, cows are the lifeblood for the Maasai. And so 
that what, what could he do? He could donate a cow to the American people. Um, after telling the story to people in his community, 13 others stepped forward, and so 14 cows were donated. This is what they can do. These are people thousands of miles away, no direct connection to the attack, but feel a connection on a human scale, and this is what they can do. And so that, that herd couldn't be brought over for a variety of reasons. It's actually sort of hard to even think to bring a herd of cows over to the United States. Uh, but they were branded with a certain brand. And now there's a thriving herd in Kenya um, of cows that have been, you know, that, that come from this original donation. And it's just an amazing story and a connection, I think, for students to understand what can you do, even ways that are, that are small or ways that feel like they're not directly connected. Just, you know, you can't always choose what happens to you, but you can choose how you respond to those things. I, I love hearing those stories and those examples. And, and there's so many connections, I think, to COVID today as well that can feel real to students. How, what, what kind of resources do you have available for teachers so that they can continue teaching about 9-11 throughout the course of the year and making these connections? Yeah, so we have sort of a slate of offerings um, that, again, comes back to always to the day, but tries to sort of branch out and understand you know, how the world has changed and the relevance of 9-11, you know, almost two decades later. And so we have virtual field trips that we're going to be launching next week um, that uh, engage with, with those ideas, underscoring what happened that day, using artifacts as entry points and, you know, as lenses into these larger themes. Um, we have professional development workshops that we now offer online that have a range of breakout sessions um, where teachers can understand how to use artifacts, how to use stories, how to tackle conspiracies. I mean, there's sort of a range of things that we talk about that all tie back to 9-11 um, in some way. And so um, the, we offer those. We offer the program I mentioned a few times today already, the anniversary in the school's webinar. We have a slate of lesson plans that all tie back to artifacts, to stories in the collection, and also to experts that we've had speak in our public program series uh, that are then cut and sort of tied specifically around the collection of 9-11 to current events, national security and civil liberties. How do you balance these types of things, 9-11 and popular culture? And so these questions are ever evolving as we understand, as we understand the threat, as we understand discrimination, as we understand lots of different themes um, that all spring out of 9-11. And so we have, um, we've been very lucky to have, uh, you know, speakers from sort of a, a range of, of backgrounds come and speak here. Um, and be able to lend their expertise that then we, we can draw on and give access uh, to students and teachers. Thanks. I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that um, listening today, we have educators from all different age ranges. And I believe your programs start typically around third grade. Is that right? That's right. So we offer our virtual field trips, or I'm saying we offer our on-site field trips whenever those come back, and our virtual uh, field trips really for, for third grade and up. We, on to the program today, we have seen kindergarten and up uh, teachers, but for the most part, um, it's K-12 in addition to, to college and, and then beyond. Can you give an example of an entry point for a kindergarten teacher versus a high school teacher? Yeah, it's a great question and something that we're constantly uh, grappling with. And so, for, I mean, in terms of making our materials age appropriate, you know, a lot of that is in the use of language and how we sort of think about, you know, obviously the, the words that we use to explain what happened that day. Um, and if you're talking to an elementary school student, you're going to talk about in broad strokes what happened that day. You know, we're not going to whitewash what happened, um, but we're, we're not going to focus on some of the details that you'd focus on with the high school students, some of the foreign policy, yeah, just as an example, some of the sort of the foreign policy antecedents and repercussions of the attacks. But for younger students, again, sort of touching on what I've already spoken about is touching on, you know, how people responded, what they could do in that moment. And there's so many examples of students, of kids in the days, weeks, months, and years after 9-11, um, sending notes and letters. You know, you have uh, students being able to see what other students did who were their age at that time. You know, we've had speakers who you can go on our website and we um, have access to of, you know, students who were in, in elementary school, middle school, high school, and being able to hear their perspectives. Because it's one thing for me to tell students, uh, and I was in college at the time, but, you know, this is what it was like. And although it's interesting that, you know, when we have these chats, uh, there's so many questions. I don't have a particular 9-11 connection, but they just want to know what it was like just to be alive at, in 2001, just to know what it was like to experience, and, you know, experience something like this. Uh, and so that in and of itself is interesting, but being able to have the voices um, of those who were their age 
goes a long way to helping them make sense of something that happened um, you know, almost two decades ago. And I'll also say just to add a point to something around COVID too, is that you know, we're all living through history right now and we don't know what, what, what exactly is going to happen. And we don't have a sense of, we know something is changing, we know we're living through something and students viscerally understand this as well. And so it's the same way we felt in 2001. We knew something was happening. We knew something big that was happening that was gonna fundamentally change us in some way. We didn't know exactly what that meant or how it was all gonna play out. And look, we're, we still don't know exactly how it's going to play out. Um, but that this sense of living through something students can, can get today. Um, and it helps them, I think, understand uh, on some visceral level what it was like in 2001. Anita. I appreciate again that connection to going back to today and really thinking about it. Um, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit more about some of the professional development that you offer teachers. I know that you know really today we're talking about commemorating what happened. You mentioned that you offer professional development around conspiracy theories. Well, obviously in the midst of a global pandemic, um, an election season, any, any kind of high level strategies in general for thinking about talking to students about misinformation and disinformation? Yeah, I mean, it's so wrapped up, um, you know, in 9-11. In and today really is about commemoration. So I'll sort of talk about it at a high level. I'd love to, you know, we can, in, in some future days, sort of dive a little bit deeper. Um, but, you know, the entry point and students and teachers, you know, hear this all the time, conspiracies, whether it's 9-11 um, or whatever the conspiracy is of the moment. And there's plenty, unfortunately, to choose from. You know, the mainstreaming of conspiracies, um, I think, is a, is, has, has been, a, uh, you know, incredibly apparent and in, in, in a feature of the last, you know, X number of years. And so when we talk to teachers around conspiracies, you know, we use 9-11 as the entry point to understand um, some of the psychology behind it and tools and tips to use in the classroom to be able to tackle some of these ideas. We use 9-11, you know, we, there's certain 9-11 conspiracies that are more common than others, and we try to debunk those, again, providing facts for teachers that are digestible for them to use. Uh, but in the end, that, that, that can only go so far. Ultimately, it's, it involves uh, students being able to, um, you know, think and question, question their own thinking. And so the tips and tools that we have are really around that. It's about approaching it with, you know, generously, generously listening to some of these and being able to sort of tease out some of their thinking to get them to sort of take some steps on their own to understand um, maybe their alternative viewpoint isn't the, isn't the, the most um, uh, rational way to, to view it. So when, you, when you're saying listen generously, does that mean asking a lot of why questions and being really curious? Yeah, I think it's, again, it's not dismissing because it's just gonna make people defensive. And so I think it's, okay, this is what you think. Okay, what's the, what's the goal of the conspiracy? Okay, it was to do X. Um, okay, so is that, who had to be in on that conspiracy? Um, was there an easier way to realize that goal than, than, than you know, whatever you're saying it is? And oftentimes they're gonna find that, that there are, needs to be hundreds or thousands of people in that smoky back room to come up with something. And I think it's as you, again, don't push back. I think it's just get them to sort of talk through and think through exactly what it is. And, you know, you know, at the museum, we have, when we first opened the museum, we were really, really concerned, um, you know, on our public tours, that we were going to get lots of, I don't know if you know the term truther, but people who have alternative perspectives on what happened on 9-11. Um, and so we did a lot of work around our staff really understanding what happened, but then also being able to explain it in ways that, that made sense. And we, we have very, very, I can count them on one or two hands in the last few years of people who actually were disruptive in the way that you might expect them to be disruptive. I think when people come to the site, this is where it happened. There's a reverence that comes, I think, for most people when, when they're at the site. I should say too, that when students come, I've worked in other museums as well, there's a, it's just a different feeling oftentimes in other places. Um, but with students, when we get these questions, there's not necessarily an agenda behind it. There's totally rational questions that people want to understand a little bit more about why, why would the buildings collapse? What exactly happened? Not with an agenda behind it, but because they're, they've heard something or they just want to better understand. And so I think, you know, I, I sort of separate those two groups in terms of how you approach it, because those questions are totally normal and natural, and we have answers that make a lot of sense um, to those questions. And so I think it's, 
it's with those students, it's being able to have accurate information to be able to present to them so they can understand. You know, I, I'm thinking that um, something that could potentially hold back some teachers from talking about 9-11 could be fear of not having all the answers. And so I guess what's your advice to in terms of a teacher who may be feeling like, oh, I don't want to talk about this. What if a student asks a question like you're suggesting and I don't know and goes down this other path. So what, what's your advice there? It's a great question. I will say that, uh, you know, we, when we have, uh, go, you know, we have, uh, you know, constant staff trainings um, here. And we, from day one, just try to embed the idea that it's okay to not know the answer to something. It's, it is, model being a lifelong learner and saying, you know, I don't know, let's look it up together. Because there are plenty of things I know, you know, I know a lot about 9-11, but I certainly don't know everything about 9-11. And it's completely okay. And thinking about the again, to come back today, just because it's so present in my mind, you know, having these conversations with students who are asking me lots of technical questions. I don't know the answer to some of these things. And so I say, I don't know the answer. Let me try to get an answer for you. And I think that's, that's okay. Um, you know, in, a sh in terms of a, a shameless plug, we have lots of great information on our site that I think is useful for teachers to be able to incorporate. I think our programs do a good job of training teachers to be able to have these conversations with students. And a big reason why we uh, structure the program today, especially the way that we have, is because, you know, this is at the very beginning of the school year. For New York City schools, in a normal year, this is the first week of school. And so, you know, teachers have so much to be able to grapple with be able to dive into such a difficult, challenging, emotional, sensitive topic as 9-11, that's a lot to ask. And so we feel very confident and strongly that you put, put that on us, you know, give us the question so we can talk to your students and be able to answer that as much, much as we can. And so then in your own time, as it, as it comes up in your own curriculum, um, it gives you the time to sort of think about um, how you'd approach some of these things and be able to use our resources in that way. Yeah, that's really helpful. And I, and I appreciate the highlighting of modeling, I don't know, because, you know, as teachers, we're, we're going to be talking about a lot of challenging topics that we don't know the answers for. Um, so I'd love it, uh, to kind of wrap up. What are, what are the top, let's say, three takeaways you'd like for everyone to leave with today? Um, the first is that um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pausing because I'm, I'm sort of wrapped up in, in, in the day today. The first is that a key part of 9-11, and I know I've said this over and over again, is that people didn't stop at the horror. They didn't stop at the trauma. They chose to do something to fix it. And there's so many stories that are worth focusing on that, that, that outweigh the, the horror of that day. And I think focusing on those examples, and there's, there's so many of them, um, does the story justice, and I think helps you talk about this in an effective way in your classroom. I mean, a key feature of 9-11 uh, is that everyone can see themselves in this story. Uh, you know, if you've, again, if you've been to the museum, you know, we have an exhibition, a memorial exhibition that has pictures of all the victims. And you go in there, and I could tell this to anyone I'm speaking with, you're gonna see someone who looks like you, who has a similar story as you, um, seems like someone in your family or a friend or someone you aspire to be, uh, you know, that's, this, there's a universality to the story. There's a humanity to the story um, that offers anyone an entry point. And I think um, there aren't many things like that anymore. There aren't many things that sort of glue us together in such a fractured world. And so I think that um, I want to highlight that first and foremost. I think also, you know, underscoring with your students the idea that, uh, and this is connected, is that you can't always choose what happens to you. That's, we don't always have agency over that, but you can choose how you respond. And again, those stories offer models for something like that. Um, I think it's also important to underscore the fact that, you know, what happens in places that seem very far away, very much can have an impact on what happens here. Um, and I think that's always worth underscoring. Um, and, you know, I think it's as sort of a, a concluding point, uh, is that, and this goes back to the storytelling aspect of this, is that, you know, this can, this happened to regular people. This is history. They're not, it's just people who went to work, 
or got on an airplane or went about their day um, who were caught up in something like this. And so I think being able to understand that there's a, again, this sort of universality of things to this, and that universality um, now impacts the very world that we're living in in ways that um, are, you know, in, in many ways invisible but are ever present um, is something I think worth underscoring with students as well. Thank you so much, Noah. I really want to thank you and, and your whole team um, and just know that we're, we appreciate you helping us commemorate 9-11 today. Um, I want to let everyone joining today know that this conversation will be posted to our Common Sense Education YouTube channel, along with links and resources shared and discussed in our chat today, as well as uh, resources to um, the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. Thank you again, Noah. Thank you so much for having me. Take care, everyone.